I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Kings chapter 2. First Kings chapter 2. This is our scripture reading for the sermon this evening. I remind you that this is God's inspired, inerrant, and infallible word given for our instruction and edification. Let us give our attention to its reading. When David's time to, to die drew near, he commanded Solomon, his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Moreover, you also know what Joab the son of Zeruiah did to me, how he dealt with the two commanders of the armies of Israel, Abner the son of Ner, and Amasa the son of Jether, whom he killed, avenging in time of peace for blood that had been shed in war and putting the blood of war on the belt around his waist and on the sandals on his feet. Act therefore according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray, hair, his gray head go down to Sheol in peace, but deal loyally with the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite, and let them be among those who eat at your table. For with such loyalty they met me when I fled from Absalom your brother. And there is also with you Shimei the son of Gera, the Benjaminite from Bahurim, who cursed me with a grievous curse on the day when I went to Mahanaim. When he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. Now therefore, do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man. You will know what you ought to do to him, and you shall bring his gray head down with blood to Sheol. And David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of David his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. Then Adonijah, the son of Hagith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and she said, Do you come peacefully? He said, Peacefully. And then he said, I have something to say to you. She said, Speak. He said, You know that the kingdom was mine, and that all Israel fully expected me to reign. However, the kingdom has turned about and become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. And now I have one request to make of you. Do not refuse me. She said to him, Speak. And he said, Please ask King Solomon. He will not refuse you to give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife. Bathsheba said, Very well. I will speak for you to the king. So Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Adonijah. And the king rose to meet her and bowed down to her. And he sat on his throne and had a seat brought for the king's mother. And she sat on his right. Then she said, I have one small request to make of you. Do not refuse me. And the king said to her, Make your request, my mother, for I will not refuse you. She said, Let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah your brother as his wife. King Solomon answered his mother, and why do you ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is my older brother, and on his side are Abiathar the priest and Joab the son of Zeruiah. And King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, God do so to me, and more also, if this word does not cost Adonijah his life. Now therefore, as the Lord lives, who has established me and placed me on the throne of David my father, and who has made me a house as he promised, Adonijah shall be put to death today. So King, King Solomon sent Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and he struck him down, and he died. And to Abiathar the priest, the king said, Go to Anathoth, to your estate, for you deserve death. But I will not at this time put you to death, because you carried the ark of the Lord God before David my father, and because you shared in all my father's affliction. So Solomon expelled Abiathar from being priest to the Lord, thus fulfilling the word of the Lord that he had spoken concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. When the news came to Joab, 
for Joab had supported Adonijah, although he had not supported Absalom. Joab fled to the tent of the Lord and caught hold of the horns of the altar. And when it was told King Solomon, Joab has fled to the tent of the Lord, and behold, he is beside the altar. Solomon sent Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, saying, Go, strike him down. So Benaiah came to the tent of the Lord and said to him, The king commands, Come out. But he said, No, I will die here. Then Benaiah brought the king word again, saying, Thus said Joab, and thus he answered me. The king replied to him, Do as he has said, strike him down and bury him, and thus take away from me and from my father's house the guilt for the blood that Joab shed without cause. The Lord will bring back his bloody deeds on his own head, because without the knowledge of my father David, he attacked and killed with the sword two men more righteous and better than himself, Abner the son of Ner, commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa the son of Jether, commander of the army of Judah. So shall their blood come back on the head of Joab and on the head of his descendants forever. But for David and for his descendants and for his house and for his throne, there shall be peace from the Lord forevermore. Then Benaiah the son of Jehoiada went up and struck him down and put him to death. He was buried in his own house in the wilderness. The king put Benaiah the son of Jehoiada over the army in place of Joab, and the king put Zadok the priest in the place of Abiathar. Then the king sent and summoned Shimei and, sa and said to him, Build yourself a house in Jerusalem and dwell there, and do not go out from there to any place whatever. From the day you go out and cross the brook Kidron, know for certain that you shall die. Your blood shall be on your own head. And Shimei said to the king, What you say is good. As my lord the king has said, so will your servant do. So Shimei lived in Jerusalem many days. But it happened at the end of three years that two of Shimei's servants ran away to Achish, son of Mekah, king of Gath. And when it was told Shimei, Behold, your servants are in Gath, Shimei arose and saddled the donkey and went to Gath to Achish to seek his servants. Shimei went and brought his servants from Gath. And when Solomon was told that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and returned, the king sent and summoned Shimei and said to him, Did I not make you swear by the Lord and solemnly warn you, saying, Know for certain that on the day you go out and go to any place whatever, you shall die. And you said to me, What you say is good, I will obey. Why then have you not kept your oath to the Lord and the commandment with which I commanded you? The king also said to Shimei, You know in your own heart all the harm that you did to David my father. So the Lord will bring back your harm on your own head. But King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. And the king commanded Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and he went out and struck him down, and he died. So the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. The grass withers, and the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray and ask God's blessing upon our examination of his word this night. Gracious Father, we come before you this night, having heard your word, we turn now to consider it deeper, to understand it within its context. For Lord, there is much here in this chapter that is foreign to our ears, it does not appear to be a kingdom of peace, as Solomon was said to reign in peace. And so, Lord, help us to understand. Help us to understand this context and see how you established Solomon. But most of all, his justice and mercy are clear in this chapter. Help us to understand how these two come together most clearly in the kingdom of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, we have embarked on a new book. Part of the same story that we began some months ago. Looking at the kingdom of Israel, the establishment of King David in First and Second Samuel, and now in his son Solomon. And we're going to see many sons to come. These books of First and Second Kings will be full not just of kings, but also of prophets, of others who challenge God as well as God's challenge toward his people. These books will have many highs and many lows. There's much to learn, uh, and especially to help us to understand the purpose of kingship among God's people. For God is king over his people. This is how the story begins, that is, all the way back in Genesis. God would reign over his creation. 
Moreover, when the people asked for a human king and God would give them Saul, he tells Samuel that Samuel is not the one being rejected, but God is being rejected as king over his people. And so there is a tension in the Old Testament story of kingship and one that we want to do justice to and understand clearly. That tension is going to be that there are things that take place in this earthly kind of kingdom that we that, that are just not part of our understanding when it comes to the kingdom of our Savior Jesus Christ. We've already seen that. We've seen that in the life of David. We've seen that in David's sins, in, in David's conquests. We see it clearly before us in our chapter today. But that tension should not scare us away. For the Apostle Paul reminds us that whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. We might have hope. It is our goal as we study this book together to find and understand that hope that we have with Christ as our King. For in Christ, the entire purpose of the kingship comes round to where it began. God reigns over his people. And he does so through great David's greater son. That kingdom that began in David then is continued. And we saw that last week as, as there was a threat to the throne. And just like when we move from Genesis to Exodus, we find a new king, that is Pharaoh, who did not know Joseph. So also in 1 Kings, we learn of a new son of David, who did not learn from Absalom's error. Adonijah believed that the kingdom was his by right. He believed that merely by being the eldest brother, or the one that was eldest in descent, that he should have the kingdom. But that has never been the way of God's covenant promises. That is not how they have worked. After all, we know from even our studies of the book of Genesis, of Isaac and Ishmael, of Jacob and Esau, of Ephraim and Manasseh. The younger is blessed. The younger receives the promise. And it's also not just about being the younger. It's always about faith. It was always about faith. And indeed, that comes to the fore in our story tonight in chapter 2 of 1 Kings, in the establishment of Solomon's reign, the establishment of Solomon's kingdom. As a matter of fact, that term established is used over and over in this chapter, making clear the purpose of our chapter. It wasn't enough to have a general kingdom that would continue. God's chosen son was to be established. And tonight we see a Solomon is established in his reign. But as I've already said here in this chapter, we see two themes coming together. The theme of justice and the theme of mercy. Now I'm going to need to spell that out and show us how that is because all we tend to see in a chapter like this is all the bloodshed. We can look at this chapter and think there is Solomon acting like just like any other king, slaughtering those that would oppose him. How can we possibly think that this kingdom would be blessed? But here in this chapter, Solomon is bringing God's justice as well as extending mercy under the command of his father, David. Justice and mercy. Those two attributes of God, not the only two, but two of those attributes of God, they do not cancel one another out. Both must be met even as we see both at work in the establishment of Solomon and his kingdom. So our story tonight picks up with David's death. In some ways, we've been waiting and watching David die all this time. After all, back in 2 Samuel, we heard David's last words, but then the chapters went on. And then last week, we, we saw David again uh, 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 intervening to save his kingdom. Here, though, David will die. In the opening verses of our chapter, we read that David's time to die drew near. He says that he is going to go the way of all the earth. The way of all the earth. David's words remind us of the reality of the fall, the curse of sin and death. Because Adam and Eve had disobeyed, God was going to bring, God brought in death into creation. After all, he tells Adam that he would return to the ground. For out of it he was taken. He says, for your dust, the dust you shall return. 
In this way, then, David's death is even taking place in part of this larger context, this bigger story that reminds us of the reality of sin. But in the midst of that moment, he has other business on his mind. He wants to charge his son to be strong. He says there in his charge to, to him, be strong and show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses. This charge uh, uh, is reminiscent of the one that Moses would give to Joshua. It's reminiscent of how God told Moses that the king over his people was to obey the words of his law. Indeed, even writing out a copy of the law for himself. And why does Solomon, why, why, why does David say this to Solomon? Is there in verse 4, it says that the Lord may establish, there's that, that word again, establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart, with all their soul, we shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Here we see a promise as well as a precept or a principle. The promise was the messianic line. The promise was that God had established David and would establish his house and indeed would bring it about so that that was the line of Judah. That is, as we begin in Genesis with Abraham and it whittles down to Judah, so now it whittles down to one family in the line of Judah. And that is David. And God promised that he would have a son on the throne forever. But notice that the promise comes with a precept or a principle, the faithfulness of the king. If your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. God had promised David that the Messiah would come from his line, and that promise was absolute. But the promise that there should not fail him, a man on the throne, was conditional that line must be faithful. And here again will be that tension in the story of David's sons. For we know that they will be unfaithful. We know as the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3, there is no one who does good, no, not one. Indeed, David's own death is a ringing reminder of the reality of sin, the problem that it presents. That problem is that, is that no mere man would be able to keep the law of God. That no mere descendant of David would be able to be faithful. And so even in the establishing of this kingdom under Solomon, there's a tension that will carry on. And that tension at times will make us uncomfortable. But it's important to see it because it will only find its resolution in Christ. Well, David, he's preparing to die. He makes these requests of Solomon. These requests that have to do with Joab, the son of Zeruiah. The request that has to do with Barzillai, the Gileadite. The request that has to do with Shimei. And we're going to see with regard to Joab as well as Shimei that Solomon will do, will, will follow through with that. There's no reason to think that he doesn't follow through with Barzillai the Gileadite as well. But notice how each of these fall out. They have to do with the justice of God and God's mercy. The king demanded justice. Justice in the case of Joab and Shimei. Judgment against Joab, not for his participation with Absalom, nor his participation with Adonijah, but rather on the deaths of Abner and Amasa. Indeed, David says that those were against himself. It's reminiscent of the way that Jesus will confront Saul in Acts chapter 9 and ask him, Saul, Saul, why are you, perse why are you persecuting me? And Saul persecutes the church. But the actions against those under David's care are against David himself. And so he calls for judgment against Joab. It had been some time since his sins had been committed. But time does not wear out the guilt of sin. Barzillai, as I said, is, is, uh, is given mercy. That mercy that David had given to him and to his sons is extended through Solomon. You remember Barzillai if you weren't with us through 2 Samuel 
It was when David was run out of the kingdom by Absalom. Marzalai met him and brought food to him, provided for him and his men, and so he, David extended a mercy to Barzillai. The story of Shimei is in 2 Samuel chapter 16. The one who cursed David, remember, for some 20 miles, throwing rocks at him and cursing him, calling him a worthless man, a man of blood, and saying that when Absalom had run him out, that God was actually, was actually avenging the house of Saul. He accused him of taking the kingdom in an ungodly way and said he was unworthy of reign. Now he will be held to account for his words. Though he had had a stay of execution in 2 Samuel chapter 19, Solomon would know what he ought to do. And what's really interesting is as, we, as this chapter unfolds, we begin to see some of the wisdom that Solomon will actually be granted by God in chapter 3. It's in wisdom that Solomon acts. Well, this part of our passage closes out with David's rest. We read that David slept with his fathers. He was buried in the city of David. And David, that sweet psalmist of Israel, who would, who would write in Psalm 16 and verse 9, My heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, knowing that he would not be abandoned to Sheol, but would be at God's right hand forevermore. Indeed, in the presence of the Lord, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, Psalm 116 and verse 15. And so Solomon sat on the throne of, his fa- of David his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. Verse 12, there's that resounding gong again, established. David said it would be God who would establish Solomon. There is no reason for us to turn around and think that Solomon is the one manipulating things here. No, it is God who establishes him. And we see in our text that Adonijah makes one last grasp at the throne. There in verse 13, the way that it falls out, Solomon goes uh, to Bathsheba and desires an audience with her. He says that he comes peacefully and he asks for only one thing. It's a small thing, just something small, maybe a keepsake of sorts. He wants Abishad, the Shunammite. Remember that she was the one appointed, sought out for David as a concubine in chapter 1 because he was, he was too cold and he could not keep himself warm. And so he wants Abishai. It's hard to know what to make of this moment. Was Bathsheba understanding what, what Adonijah wanted and so therefore she's setting him up to be judged by Solomon? Is she really... Naive to think that uh, um, giving over this uh, concubine would mean nothing. Um, Matthew Henry, he goes back and forth and talks about it and says, of all the things that should have struck her was, was the incest of it all. After all, this was David's wife. In Leviticus 18 in verse 8 says, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. Taking the concubine even of David to be a way of solidifying the kingdom under himself. And indeed we see that Solomon understands this for the queen mother goes to Solomon. He brings her a chair. He bows down to her. He, 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 he sets, it up, sets it up so that she can make the one request. This is an aside. If you've ever talked with, 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 with Roman Catholics about the place of Mary in heaven, they'll often point at, at, at Bathsheba in the role of, of counselor for Solomon. So that Mary would go to Jesus. I just find it I mean, a bit ironic that it only happens once and she's rejected. Not Mary, but, but Bathsheba. Solomon sees the problem. He doesn't grant her request. No. It's not a small request. He sees perfectly what it is. He says, why do you ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also. There in verse 22. After all, this is what Absalom did to solidify his reign over Israel. When he had run David out, he he actually goes in at the council of Ahithophel. And he goes in to his father's concubines. In 2 Samuel 16, verses 21 and 22. And so Solomon, seeing through exactly what's going on, understanding Adonijah's request, he rebukes his mother. 
and he takes a vow upon himself there in verse 23. King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, God do so to me, and more also, if this word does not cost Adonijah his life. Remember how our chapter ended last week. Solomon had said that if Adonijah will show himself a worthy man, not one of his hairs shall fall to the earth. But if wickedness is found in him, he shall die. Adonijah dies on account of his own foolishness. He not only desires David's last concubine, but he also seeks Solomon's mother to secure the woman for him. But this last move is no more effective than what he tried in the previous chapter when he declared himself to be king. No, Adonijah will not have the throne. The kingdom will be established under Solomon. And there's a kind of replay here of Saul and David. Solomon becomes king by following the advice of his father. Adonijah, though, fails at every turn. And so that's his last attempt. Adonijah is struck down. And then that begins the, 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 the full establishment of Solomon's kingdom, which by our, by our account in this chapter takes some three years. But how does Solomon begin then? He first deals with Abiathar. Abiathar, that priest, notice that Solomon isn't just wielding the sword and going around and killing everybody. No, he says, I will not at this time put you to death because you carried the ark of the Lord God before David, my father, and because you shared in all my father's afflictions. Solomon deposes Abiathar as priest because he supported Adonijah, but Solomon does not execute him. His service to David stays his death. He had been one of the priests at Nob, if you remember back in 1 Samuel, when Saul was hunting after David, and he has slaughtered through Doag the Edomite all of the priests of Nob. Abiathar had escaped. He made his way to David, who showed him kindness and protected him. Moreover, Abiathar had carried the Ark of the Covenant when David was run out of Jerusalem by Absalom. Abiathar was sent back with the Ark of the Covenant as David put himself into the Lord's hands. But nevertheless, Solomon honors Abiathar's service. But notice verse 27. So Solomon expelled Abiathar from being priest to the Lord, thus fulfilling the word of the Lord that he had spoken concerning the house of Eli and Shiloh. Abiathar is of the house of Eli. And all the way back in 1 Samuel chapter 3, Verses 12 to 14, we find God's judgment against the house of Eli. It's interesting to think about God's providence over all things. His providence such that even this moment, even the expelling of Abiathar is according to the word that God had spoken so long before. It is clear that God is the one who establishes Solomon. It is clear that God is the one who is over all of history. It is also clear that God's judgments, though they are not executed speedily, are executed surely. What he desires will come to pass. What he declares will happen. And here we find more evidence of that. Well, here in Solomon's beginning, then, we also see that he deals with the last two individuals, Joab and Shimei. With Joab, he hears of what had happened with regard to Adonijah, and he flees. He flees to the tent of the Lord, and he catches hold of the, of the horns of the altar. Joab is an interesting character in Scripture. He's played an interesting role throughout David's life. He's the one who had secured a way for Absalom to come back into the kingdom. He had secured him grace from David, and yet that backfires as Absalom runs David out. He has been by David's side through so much of his reign. It's hard to know what to make of this moment. He did support Adonijah. But there he is, grabbing on to the horns of the altar. Some see him as seeking asylum. But the right of asylum in this sanctuary applied only to those who were involved in accidental death, not intentional homicide, as we read in Exodus 21, verses 13 and 14. 
There we read that if someone d- did not lie in wait for, for, for a person, but God let him fall into his hand, he says, then I will appoint for you a place to which he may flee. But if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from my altar, that he may die. Joab did not accidentally kill Abner and Amasa. He had intentionally done so. And notice that he, he makes a plea. He says there in verse 30, no, I will die here. His desire is to die there in the presence of God, there at the altar. Solomon is told what's going on by Benaiah. And the king says in verse 31, do as he has said, strike him down and bury him. And thus take away from me and from my father's house the guilt for the blood that Joab shed without cause. Joab had murdered, as I said already, two men. His death is a divine retribution, a judicial punishment. There is, in truth, a kind of poetic justice. For Joab had lived by the sword, killing two army commanders who happened to be his professional rivals. And now he dies by the sword. His legacy is a complex one. As I said, he's been involved in much of David's reign. He was a counselor to the king in many ways. Joab was even the man who obeyed David and put Uriah the Hittite on the front of the attack to ensure his death. He was ruthless. He did things that were wicked. He seems to acknowledge his sin here and he casts himself into God's hands. In this way, he's, in a sense, imitating David. Remember how David had said to the prophet Gad in 2 Samuel 24, after numbering Israel and receiving the judgment, he says, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. As one commentator put it, next to the altar was where the sacrifices were offered. The guilt for the murder here is put on Joab. He is the sacrifice. He takes upon himself his guilt and he is honored with a burial. Of all the blood that is shed in this chapter, only Joab is buried. His clinging to the altar, as one commentator put it, as I've wrestled with this this week, I think this is right, was his last act of faith. Matthew Henry writes, those who by a lively faith take hold on Christ and his righteousness with a resolution, if they perish, to perish there, to find in him a more powerful protection than Joab found at the horns of the altar. Well, the last person to be dealt with is Shimei, a maybe a less enigmatic figure. He's the one who had cursed David those 20 miles. He's the one who had kicked rocks at the king. And so Solomon will deal with him wisely. Shimei had spoken curses with his mouth against David, and so Solomon will give him a chance to see if his word holds true. And so he has him take a vow that he will live in one place, that he will not go out of the city. If he does, then he will bring blood on his own head. As I said, commentators commentators are divided on what's going on. Some have read all of 1 Kings 2 as Solomon maneuvering and manipulating to establish his kingdom. But that would be to ignore the words of Scripture that tell us the Lord was supposed to establish him. This is what David had said, and this is where the chapter goes. I think something more is going on here. Shimei had cursed David and said his reign was ill-gotten. Solomon then tests his words. Can Shimei's word be trusted? Did he speak truly? Or is he a liar whose words are to be rejected? And I think this is borne out by how the story goes. For Shimei takes the vow. What you say is good, as my lord the king has said, so your servant will do. He lived in Jerusalem many days. But Shimei was ultimately faithless. His words were ultimately untrue. In fact, in verse 43... After he has left and gone to go get his servants that have wandered away to the Achish, the king of Gath, Solomon says, Why then have you not kept your oath before the Lord and the commandment 
with which I commanded you. Judgment is brought upon Shimei because he violated his oath. And his curse then against David is shown to be false. He is, a one, he is one whose words cannot be trusted. David and his house are vindicated then. And so the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. Our chapter ends. The succession of Solomon then was an affirmation of the divine promise to David and a hope that was cherished by David. It was the search for, 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 for the growth of the kingdom. It's part of that Old Testament story that begins, with the, that begins with the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. It carries on to the promises to, to Moses, and Nathan, and many more. This promise, as we'll be reminded throughout our study, finds its ultimate fulfillment in the kingdom of Christ. There is much about Christ as king in the New Testament. His reign is certainly not identical to David or Solomon or his sons. And we wouldn't want it to be, for their reigns failed. But that doesn't mean that the reigns are disconnected completely. For all that David, all that Solomon, and all that the Davidic monarchy was supposed to do was to point forward to one who was a true king, one who was righteous and having self and has salvation, and who was humble. And he rode, as Zechariah 9 and verse 9 says, on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It is the kingdom of Christ to which we belong. It is the kingdom of Christ that is established. But notice that it is established the same way Solomon's kingdom is established. It is established through justice. For the cross is nothing less than the justice of God. For the righteousness that God demands that we do not have, must then, our sins must be judged. We, like Joab and Shimei, deserve condemnation. Christ takes it upon himself. The kingdom then is established in justice so that we receive mercy. This is precisely what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 3. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And it is in the cross and Christ's resurrection from the dead that his kingdom is established. His reign is established that he delivers us from the domain of darkness and transfers us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. For the believer in Christ lays claim to belonging to the kingdom that was the fulfillment of the promise to David. In the Old Testament, they looked forward to what we have in Jesus. At the cross, God's justice and mercy meet because in his eternal wisdom God knew that the cross would be the place and the way that he would prove himself to be just and the justifier. The words of Matthew Henry are true. Those who by a lively faith take hold on Christ and his righteousness with a resolution that if they perish to perish there find in him powerful protection greater than anything that Joab could even know in that moment. Our hope is secure because our king has been established.